Okay, you can be seated. God, we thank you for the worship that has been had, and as we continue to worship uh, around your word, Lord, direct our thoughts, help us to, to think rightly about who you are, help us to listen well, Lord, and I pray for your help, Lord. Uh, we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. You've most likely heard the quote, I fear all we have done is to awaken a sleeping giant and fill him with a terrible resolve. This, of course, has been attributed to the Japanese admirable Isoroku Yamamoto. Whether or not he actually said these words is debated. However, the sentiment is true. The Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor did awaken a sleeping giant. The United States would enter World War II the following day, December 8th, in just a couple days, by December 11th, the U.S. would officially have declared war against Japan, Germany, and Italy. I told you last week that John 13 is a transitional chapter in the book of John. In chapters 1 through 12, John is concerned with the signs or miracles of Jesus. In these chapters, we see Jesus among the people. We see him at a public wedding, turning water into wine at a public well offering a Samaritan woman spiritual water. He is found as far north as Capernaum, north of the Sea of Galilee, feeding the multitudes and offering himself up as the bread of life. And as far south as Jerusalem, where he rides into the city on a donkey with the voices of the crowds hailing the messianic entreaty, Hosanna, or save us now. This transition in Chapter 13 begins with the events of the Passover feast. In this chapter, we see the world shut out, and we have Jesus alone with his disciples. The focus moves from the world to those who were his in the world. The setting is intimate, and the focus is more narrow than the opening chapters. This is the last time Jesus will be with his disciples. Later that night, Jesus would be arrested, and before sundown the next day, he would in fact be laid in a tomb. In verses 1 through 17 of John chapter 13, we have the account of Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. We studied that last week. The act of service was mind-blowing precisely because of who Jesus was. Jesus was their Lord and teacher. He was God, the creator bent low not only to wash man, but to wash the lowliest part of man, his feet. This stunning act of service was designed to to teach two things. One, when a person is saved, he is bathed. But that saved person does not still need, does still, in fact, still need to have his feet washed. From a theological and metaphorical perspective, the bath of a saved person receives is called justification. And the foot washing, the foot washing a saved person receives is called sanctification. John 13, 10. The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. Like Jesus does so often, he uses the world around him to illustrate spiritual truth. When a man visits a friend's house or attends a feast, he bathes before he goes. He is clean, but on his way, he collects dirt on his feet. He needs to have his feet washed. The one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean, as Jesus said. Secondly, this breathtaking act of of service was an example to be followed. Jesus was modeling something that his followers were to do. Jesus was laying out a pattern. Jesus used the language of obligation in John 13, 14. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. So we have in verses 1 through 17 of chapter 13, the cleansing of the disciples, an illustration of spiritual status and Christian duty. Now your Bible probably doesn't show a paragraph break at verse 17, but it is there that the focus of the narrative shifts away from the foot washing scene and toward the betrayal scene, which we read this morning. And in fact, this is another cleansing scene. In verses 18 through 30, we will see the cleansing of the disciples from something that is unclean in their midst. In fact, a someone. 
and after which the stage will be set for Jesus to give his final instructions to his disciples. I fear all we have done is to awaken a sleeping giant and fill him with a terrible resolve. This cleansing will come at a cost. The events that follow will awaken a sleeping giant. In the life of Jesus, these events stand at the edge of a precipice. Jesus has proven who he is with the signs and has gathered his men for these final instructions. The whole of salvation history is pressed up against this moment, this very night. This highest and most important moment in salvation, salvation history is but hours away. And as we will see, Jesus himself sets the events in motion. As a group, the disciples were in need of a cleansing because there was, in fact, a snake in the grass. One of them was a traitor. As we study the betrayal of Jesus, we're going to learn two lessons which will enable us to think rightly about God and ourselves. Each one of these lessons will form our outline. Let's turn then to our text and learn the first lesson The knowledge of God's sovereignty over the worst of events is advantageous. Let's pick up our reading at verse 18 of chapter John chapter 13. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen. But the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I am telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. We, of course, begin in verse 18, just mid-thought. What is Jesus talking about? He's speaking of the example given to wash one another's feet and the blessing that comes from following that example. And he says that there is one in the room that cannot follow this example and therefore cannot receive the blessing that proceeds. I am not speaking of all of you. Or what I, what I have just said does not refer to all of you. This reference is to the one who will betray. And Jesus has already alluded to this betrayer twice. You remember verse 2 of chapter 13. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. And then verse 10 and 11. Jesus said to him, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not every one of you, for he knew who was to betray him. That was why he said, not all of you are clean. Now, when Jesus says in verse 18, I know whom I have chosen, he is not talking about the doctrine of election. As true as that doctrine is, He is not talking about that doctrine here. What he is talking about is his absolute sovereignty over the situation. You recall John chapter 6, verse 70. Did I not choose you, the 12, Jesus says, and yet one of you is a devil? Jesus knew who Judas was and knew what Jesus would do. Jesus continues this thought by quoting Psalm 41, verse 9. But the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. Judas is not taking Jesus by surprise. And there are other passages in the Old Testament that have this ring of Judas' betrayal. Recall Psalm 55, verses 12 and 14. This is David, of course. For it is not an enemy who taunts me, then I could bear it. It is not an adversary who deals insolently with me, then I could hide from him. But it is you, a man, my equal, my companion, my familiar friend. We used to take sweet counsel together within God's house. We walked in the throng. We walked among the congregation. Or Psalm 109, verse 8. May his days be few. May another take his offense. Take his office, excuse me. Peter quotes that in the opening chapter of the book of Acts. Or Zechariah chapter 11, verses 11 through 13. Then I said to them... If it seems good to you, give me your wages, but if not, keep them. And they weighed out as my wages 30 pieces of silver. Then the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, the lordly price at which I was priced by them. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord to the potter. This is exactly what Judas did. Judas conspired with the chief priests for 30 pieces of silver. And seeing that Jesus was condemned 
under the weight of regret, he threw the pieces of silver back into the temple. The chief priest, being okay with crucifying the Son of God, couldn't imagine using the money to fund the temple. So what did they do? They purchased a potter's field, which came to be known as the field of blood. Jesus is quoting Psalm 41 to substantiate the fact that the events of his betrayal and his trial and execution are not outside of his control. That's why he says in verse 19, I am telling you this now before it takes place that when it does take place, my betrayal, you may believe that I am he. Jesus was not some beguiled or weak victim of an unsuspecting treachery. No, Jesus was the very one sent from God to accomplish his divine purpose. And Jesus has the thoughts of those he loves in mind. Jesus doesn't want the devil to have any opportunity to weaken his troops, so he tells the men these things so that when these events unfold, they may believe, as he says, that I am he. Now, you probably know that the, one of the themes of the Gospel of John is this little phrase, I am. John records Jesus using this phrase seven times, and he often attaches it to a metaphor. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And finally, I am the vine. Jesus also records using the phrase like we have it here, simply, I am he, or as he says in John, uh, John chapter 8, before Abraham was, I am. The emphatic expression, I am, was, for the Jews, connected to God's name. In the Old Testament, the name of God is derived from the simple verb, to be, haya. This is how God revealed, to his name, uh, revealed his name to Moses in Exodus chapter 3. You remember, I am who I am. God is the self-existent one. His name is, he is. <laughs> he always will be, he always was. He is. He is the self-existent one. The Jews of Jesus' day understood, when, understood that when Jesus says, I am, he was claiming to be God. And so in John chapter 5, John chapter 8, when he, when he does this, they pick up stones to try to kill him. Jesus himself affirmed last week, we read, that he, was, he, he affirmed himself that he was Lord and teacher. And this week we see his, another self-affirmation that he says, I am. He is claiming to be God. He is claiming to be Yahweh. Jesus wants his disciples to see his sovereignty in the events that are about to unfold. Jesus is not afraid of affirming the sovereignty of God over even the most sinister of events. The quotation from Psalm 41 is helpful to establish the sovereignty of God over the situation, but it also adds some color to this villainous event. In Psalm 41, David is lamenting about the fact that even his closest friends have turned against him. Jesus sees this treachery that David experienced, and he uses it as a reference to his own treachery by quoting it. In the ancient Near Eastern culture, eating bread at the table of a superior was a pledge of loyalty. You might recall the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal. You remember when uh, the prophets of Baal gather and, and Elijah gathers and he calls down you know, fire from the Lord and the fire from Yahweh comes down and consumes and licks up the water of Elijah's offering. Well, how were, how were those prophets of Baal identified? It says in 1 Kings 18 that they, they, they ate at Jezebel's table. Who were the prophets of Baal? Those ones that sit at Jezebel's table. That's how they were identified. That's where their allegiance was because they ate with her. To betray the person with whom bread had been eaten was to turn hospitality on its head. Now, Jesus had already done this in the positive by washing the disciples' feet. Now Judas would turn hospitality on its head in the negative by betraying the host of the meal. The psalm says that the one who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. There are many possible allusions here. It may simply be a nod to the ancient Near Eastern cultural faux pas of showing a person the bottom of your feet. It may be some kind of turned reference to Genesis 3.15. It most likely is it symbolizes, the, the, the kick symbolizes the termination of intimate fellowship. 
The intimacy of eating a meal together is contrasted with a blow from a foot, a kick of the heel. The two are at odds with one another. Verse 20, truly, truly, I say to you, Jesus says, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. The words of the solemn statement seem rather surprising here. I think Jesus is bringing together a couple things. First, to receive the sent one, a sent one, is to receive the sender. Whoever received this, the disciples received Jesus. Whoever received Jesus receives the Father. This truth comes right after Jesus says that he is the I am. It is because Jesus is the I am that the one who receives Jesus receives the one who sent him, namely the Father. In this way, the unity of God becomes the foundation for finding God. If we find Jesus, we have found God. Whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. This truth is also found in those who follow Jesus because they are sent by him and are therefore united with him. You remember Romans chapter 6, verse 5. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. Our union with Christ means that if someone accepts us, they accept the one we are united to. Whoever receives the one I send receives me. Secondly, the verse also serves to place the disciples in contrast to Judas. The disciples received Christ. Judas did not. He was the one that lifted his heel against Jesus. Not receiving Jesus meant Judas did not receive the one who sent Jesus, namely the Father. Finally, this verse is meant to give the disciples confidence of their mission. They had been commissioned by God, and they need not lose faith or confidence in the midst of Jesus removing this unclean one. Their mission has not changed. Therefore, what we learn in verses 18 through 20 is this. The knowledge of God's sovereignty over the worst of events is advantageous, which is our outline point. The disciples could not know everything at this point, but Jesus is giving them the keys of understanding the events that are about to unfold. It is to the advantage of the disciples to know that the worst of events are being controlled by God. Verse 19, I am telling you this now, before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. We have a tendency of seg segregating God from the painful events of our life. But God wants to comfort us by saying that he is right in the middle of all of those painful events. Now, friends, I don't want to pretend like I know what it feels like to experience the worst of events, because I don't. Those things lie yet in my future. I do, however, know that God desires that we keep him in the midst of our pain. Friends, J Jesus was rejected. He was hated. He was abandoned, he was betrayed, he was denied, he was condemned, he was spit upon, he was mocked, he was pierced, and he was killed. Yet Isaiah 53, 6 says, all we sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And verse 10 of Isaiah 53 says, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. God's sovereignty in the midst of the most heinous events helps us to look at what is to come. Friends, the knowledge of God's sovereignty over the worst of events is advantageous. We have talked a lot about suffering lately. Maybe I could just add one verse to the conversation. 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 helpful. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. This is Paul reflecting on the challenges surrounding his journeys. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. And then look what he says here. 
For what purpose was, did all this stand? But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Paul saw that the sufferings that he experienced were there to remind him and point him to the God who raises the dead. Our greatest enemy finds its, its, its answer in the God that we love and we know. He raises the dead. All that can happen to us is that we die. That's it. And then God, the one we trust, raises our dead bodies. And so that's the God that we look to in the midst of our pain. And there's no greater, no heinous, more villainous event than Jesus, our Savior, crucified. I pray that as we walk together through what is inevitable, and friends, there will be more suffering coming. I pray that as we walk through that, that we will only see our suffering from this perspective. With the affirmation of God's involvement in the midst of his betrayal, we will learn our second lesson from this betrayal. Number two, the potential of man's sinfulness in the best of circumstances is appalling. Let's turn and look closer at Judas. And Jesus moves from the coming of his betrayal to its commencement with great emotion. Verse 21. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified. It's emphatic, and he testified. Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. We can see the humanity of our Lord here. While holding all of knowledge, he is filled with emotion concerning the coming events. Jesus is troubled. The word carries the idea of being disturbed, being upset, being confused, being agitated. Very literally, it means to be stirred. In John chapter 5, it's used of water being stirred. Jesus is troubled like the stirring of a sea or the movement of a storm. He is experiencing violent emotional agitation. Interestingly, Jesus is described three times in the Gospel of John this way. This word, he is troubled, is used three times. At the death of, death of Lazarus, maybe you remember. John records that Jesus was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. At the thought of his own death in John chapter 12, Jesus records Jesus saying, John records Jesus saying, Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say, Father, save me from this hour? But for this purpose, I have come to this, this hour. Father, glorify your name. So at the death of Lazarus and at his death, he's greatly troubled. And again here, at the thought of his betrayal and death, Jesus was troubled. In each of these, Jesus is troubled in the context of death. Jesus was troubled by death. He was stirred to emotion, even anguish or agitation by death. As the perfect example, Jesus is teaching us how we are to think about the great enemy of man. It is fascinating that the knowledge of events does not cripple Jesus from an emotional experience. Knowing the outcome didn't remove the pains of the journey. Jesus had every reason to be stoic or resigned in his feelings, but he was not. Jesus was not milk toast, he was moved. Filled with emotion, Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Jesus has already mentioned the betrayer, but now he is most specific. He says that his betrayer is, in fact, in the room. Verse 22, the disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. Interesting here, no one suspected Judas. Judas. Of course, it speaks to his subterfuge or his trickery and the rightness or fairness by which Jesus would have treated him. No one suspected Judas. Secondly, notice that Judas remains unmoved. In the face of Jesus being stirred, the betrayer remains unstirred. Imagine staring at Jesus, who is visually moved. He makes this emphatic statement. Demanding attention, attention. Truly, truly, I say to, you, say to you, one of you will betray me. While the sound of this statement is still resonating in the room, the disciples are glancing back and forth at one another, thinking, who? Verse 23, 
who? Who could this be? And Judas looks back into their faces as if to accuse them for being the one. Just after, as it says in Luke 22, he had already conspired to make a deal with the chief priests to betray Jesus. And Matthew goes further. He helps us to see the duplicity of Judas, who even goes as far as to say, is it I, Rabbi? One of his disciples, verse 23, whom Jesus loved was reclining at table at Jesus' side. Now, much has been written about this little phrase, the one whom Jesus loved. This is the very first time it's used in the gospel, and John uses it four more times. The title is John's way of indirectly referring to himself. For whatever reason, John doesn't write his name into the gospel, but he uses this phrase, the one whom Jesus loved, of course, for himself. It is John that is literally reclining in the lap or at the side of Jesus. It is the proximity of John to Jesus that will enable him to find out who the betrayer is. Now, during a typical Passover meal, there were several couches they would be placed in a U shape around a table. And at the middle point of the U would sit the main couch where three would be gathered, the host and the first and second guest. The first guest of honor would sit to the left of the host, and the second, the second guest of honor would sit to the right. The, te- the text is not specific, but clearly the, the disciple whom Jesus loved was sitting at one of these two spots. Verse 24, so Simon Peter motioned to him or nodded to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. Peter is always resourceful. We know that. He, he motioned or he gestured to John to ask Jesus who, the, who this betrayer is. In regards to the seating arrangements, clearly Peter is not in one of the two places of honor. For if he was, he could have asked Jesus himself. Peter is, in fact, further away from our Savior. So the disciple, leaning back against Jesus in verse 25, said to him, Lord, who is it? John was so near to Jesus that all that was required for him to do was to lean back in order to question Jesus, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas the son of Simon Iscariot. If John was in the place of honor and Peter was not, and Judas was so close as to be given a piece of bread, it is most likely the case that the betrayer was sitting at the very side of Jesus in one of the two places of honor. Here we have Judas running headlong into the most devastating providence. When Judas takes the morsel of bread, he sets on course a series of actions that will put the Son of Man on the cross. Everything was standing ready, and with, the, and with the passing of the morsel, the deal was done. The final events of God's plan of redemption will begin to unfold. For everyone in the room except John, this would be a picture of Jesus' friendship with Judas. The act would have appeared to show favor, but to John and for us, it is really a signal of who this betrayer is. And Judas, most likely swelling with pride, accepts the morsel. You recall when Peter denied Christ? Luke, Luke 22. Luke says that somehow in the midst of denial, the Lord turned, and in, in that moment, their eyes met. He denied Christ, and he turned, and, and they saw each other. They looked into each other's face. The words that Jesus spoke concerning Peter's betrayal rushed upon him. The images and prophetic words flipping through his head. Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. But how does Peter respond? He went out and wept bitterly. He literally wept with agony. What about Judas' response? It's exactly the opposite. He does more than catch an eye through a crowd. He heard the prophecy. He has deceived those in the room by claiming innocence, thus accepting or thus accusing one of them. He has received a foot washing and a morsel of bread from the very Lord himself. Yet there's no contrition, there's no shame, 
There's no feelings of guilt. Judas accepts the morsel, and it says in verse 27, then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, what you are going to do, do quickly. Judas' betrayal of Jesus has the most serious consequences. Eating the bread was the door that allowed Satan to enter him. The language of entering is used in the context of demon possession, but this is no mere demon. This is Satan himself. The sleeping giant has been awakened, and now he has permitted to do what he is going to do. Jesus himself opened the cage and let the dragon out. Listen to how one man describes these events. And that final act of love becomes, with a terrible intimacy, the decisive moment of judgment. At that moment, we are witnessing the climax of the action of sifting, of separation, of judgment, which has been the central theme of John's account of the public ministry of Jesus. So the final gesture of acceptance precipitates the final surrender of Judas to the power of darkness. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has neither understood it nor mastered it. Jesus said to him, what you are going to do, do quickly. This is a command from Jesus. This is similar to the command Jesus will give to Judas later that night in the garden. Friend, do what you came for. Jesus is commanding Judas to do what he has already in his heart decided to do. It shows again that Jesus is in control of the situation and not a mere victim of these events. In verses 28 29, we see some confusion then among the disciples as to why or what exactly Jesus spoke to him. Verse 28, now no one at the table knew why he had said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. But seeing him leave didn't make them assume he might be the traitor. Interesting again. After all of this, a man stands up and leaves. There's no assumption that it was actually Judas who was the betrayer. They thought he was ordered to make purchases for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which would begin right after the Feast of Passover. Others, presumably further away or maybe distracted, assumed Judas may have stepped out to give alms to the poor. On the night of the feast, the gates of the city would be left open and the poor would come in and people would give Of course, they thought wrongly that it meant more if they gave at a feast. Now, as we read these events, we're struck by the indifference of the apostles. They just seem to be unmoved by the news of the betrayer. The best that they can do is have one of them whisper to the other to find out who the turncoat is. We might have expected them to block the door and demand the traitor be unmasked. Their deficiency most likely speaks to the unthinkable realities that were about to transpire, that were about to transpire in just mere hours. Think about how fast the events would unfold. In just a few hours or sooner, they would walk across the brook brook Kindron to the Garden of Gethsemane, less than a mile away. It was there that the sound of Roman soldiers would be heard. Jesus would be arrested, of course, betrayed again with a kiss. He would be put on trial, he'd be flogged, he'd be crucified and laid in the tomb all by the end of the following day. Who could imagine all of that so fast? There's no way that the apostles would have thought this to be possible, especially in light of the fact that Jesus just rode in the city a week earlier to the, to the accolades of the crowd. The apostles' unassertiveness is a testimony to the sheer unthinkableness of the events that were to transpire. So in verse 30, we read, after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out. He immediately went out, and it was night. Judas left to do his work. We recall Jesus' words when he is arrested, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. More than a time reference, Judas had shut himself out to the light of the world and had secured his place in the darkness. One commentator said, having surrendered himself to the prince of this world, Judas is banished from the light and passes out into darkness under the judgment of God. What would drive a man to such a fate? John chapter 12, verse 6. You remember Judas complained that Mary had wasted money 
Remember this? That he had wasted money by anointing Jesus with such a valuable perfume. John says, he said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was what? He was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Judas was greedy. Proverbs 11.6 says, The righteous of the upright delivers them, but the treacherous are taken captive by their own greed. Judas was taken captive by his greed. He was a thief. And the cancer of his greed spread from the material to the spiritual. Here we learn that the potential of man's sinfulness in the best of circumstances is absolutely appalling. Judas was one of the 12. He was on the inside. He had been invited into the most unique and historic group. Only 12 men, except for Matthias, who would replace Judas and Paul, have ever been, in all of world history, apostles. Jesus was all the while drawing each of these disciples in with the cords of his love, yet the greediness of Judas would not allow him to be taken in. It is evident that Judas was altogether about his own glory. He tried to shame Mary for anointing Jesus. And here in the upper room, he disguises his guilt. Judas was a poser. He was a phony. He was a pretender. You know, if the life of Judas proves anything, it's that greed is a detestable evil. And it's this kind of evil that works like a magnet to pull other evils in. The jaws of greed are unceasing, or the appetite of greed is unceasing. Paul speaks about greed in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. He says this, But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. I cannot think of a better example of that than Judas himself. It is greed that Paul says becomes a snare. The idea of a snare or a trap is that you can't get out. You can't get out of it. Being greedy is like falling through a trap door into an inescapable place. Judas was trapped by his greed. His greed led him away from the faith and caused many pangs. Greed in our life will lead us away from the gospel. Greed sets our trajectory away from God. If one of the 12 could fall through the trap door of greed, so can we. If you're struggling with greed, I would encourage you to listen to two messages from uh, Scott. Scott Maxwell taught on greed, greed in the gospel. Uh, two messages, September 4th and 11th of 2011. The gospel is the only tool that can release you from the snare of greed. Listen to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. We read this often, but it's so helpful. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy... Nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Trusting in Jesus as your substitute, as your Lord and Savior, is the only way to be washed from the sin of greed. And it's the only way to protect against the growth of greed in our hearts. Church, as I close, studying the events of Jesus' betrayal is helpful because it calls us to trust that God is in control and challenges us to be committed. God was working in and through these events to bring about his predetermined plan. And there is a man, Judas, who time after time refused to turn from his sin. The threads of God's sovereignty are woven together with the threads of man's decisions. I hope the cleansing of the disciples, both the foot washing and the removal of the betrayer, has come to you as an encouragement. Let's pray. Lord, 
we, we need your help to trust you in the worst of events. There can be no greater example than what we have seen this morning. Here Jesus is, and here the betrayer is in the room, and yet Jesus, knowing what will happen, walks forward, trusting you, Lord. What an example, what faithfulness. And yet that is in contrast to us, the potential of man's sinfulness. If we let greed go in our lives, this is the path. The end is displayed in this man, Judas, Lord. Protect us from this. Help us to look to you. Help us to reach for you, Lord. Uh, When we want to reach for what might fulfill us in this world, help us to set those things down and not pursue those things and to reach for you, Lord. Help us to look towards you and uh, confess our sins, Lord. To not be as Judas was and in the midst of what was so evident in the room, every opportunity, a a foot washing, a proclamation of who the betrayer was, uh, even in the prophetic fulfillment of putting the morsel in his mouth, all these opportunities to stop and to do what Peter did, to run out weeping with contrition, he continued to suppress it. Oh God, help us to come clean, Lord. I pray for our body. I pray that in the midst of suffering and trial, you'd be with us, Lord, that we would uh, lean not on our own understanding, but on your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.